Great. And so, um, Matt, you had some of your colleagues have done a lot of work. Uh, it's, uh, your colleagues at the Dana Farber have done a lot of work with BTK and Envision in um, in Waldenstrom. So, let's start with um, with single agent abrutinib. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, we have fairly mature data now for single agent abrutinib in Waldenstrom. Um, studies led by Steve Treon, Jorge Castillo, showing high response rates, um, good depth of response with VGPRs uh, observed with abrutinib as a monotherapy, a reasonable durability, and that's been shown in the relapse setting and now as well in the, in the frontline setting. So, I, I think that that remains a, a good option for patients with Waldenstroms. But of course, there are other other options to consider as well. Do you do you think about um, do you think about Still using chemotherapy in the frontline setting for some patients? Yeah, I think for some patients that can be an option. I mean, the, again, it goes back to the discussion of time limited therapy versus continuous therapy. And, and there, you know, you present options to the patients, and some patients may elect for a time limited therapy, even if you might expect more in the way of cytopenias and infections from, from chemotherapy. But certainly a regimen like BR can be active. Um, there's other cy cytoxin based regimens that are active in Waldenstrom's as well. Brad, there was a randomized trial that looked at um, rituximab versus rituximab. Uh, abrutinib. It looked at both frontline patients and, and relapse uh, patients and, um, uh, you know, it showed a fairly significant improvement for those patients who received the, or on the abrutinib arm. So does this totally change the way you treat um, Waldenstrom? Well, um, beating rituximab was not a s s super high bar. It's almost like trying to beat chlorambucil <laughs> in CLL. <laughs> Um, so I wasn't surprised, you know, to see that result, although it is nice to see the results quantified. And if I remember correctly, the response rates for the combination of abrutinib and rituximab showed an overall response rate of something around 80%. So that's a very good result, where it was only around 25 or 30% with single-agent rituximab. I think a more important question is, does the anti-CD20 added to the abrutinib enhance the response above and beyond what you would get with abrutinib alone? I don't think we know the answer to that question. So there's an unknown that was, that's important to sort out just like it is in CLL and, and in other settings. Abrutinib is clearly a great new option or any BTK inhibitor in uh, Waldenstrom's. Uh, similar to CLL, you know, I, I will still have a conversation with patients if it's a um, frontline patient about <clears throat> you know, the option of doing time-limited therapy with bendamustine rituximab. I hate to sound old school or old-fashioned about it, but, you know, bendamustine rituximab is uh, effective and it's pretty well tolerated for most people. So it remains, I think, a good option and should be in the conversation uh, along with abrutinib and some of the newer options that we have. Yeah, some patients seem to have this more indolent course uh, and others are moving pretty quickly. Does that change? you think the time to response might uh, sway you to use, you know, chemoimmunotherapy like, like BR versus, versus um, abrutinib or abrutinib combination? If I need a really quick response, I am more likely to use a chemotherapy-based approach like bendamustine-based. That's a little bit uh, more short. I guess, the, I guess the study really but it would have been good if it was pick your chemotherapy, in this case, bendamustine rituximab versus, uh, versus rituximab and uh, and uh, abrutinib. Yeah. yeah, John. John, what do you think? I mean, do you do you use a uh, combo with rituximab in your patients with Waldenstrom? Do you, or do you use single agent abrutinib, or, or do you not use any BTK? I mean, yeah, I think these are the patients where I'm going to add BTK if, if I was to think about single agent rituximab for a patient. Uh, to me, that uh, doesn't make a lot of sense now with the data that Brad just talked about. The addition of a BTK inhibitor to rituximab certainly seems to be uh, quite good in those patients. I think that, you know, again, we have to realize, though, that we're palliating these patients, right? So uh, the idea of not wanting to be pa have patients on therapy for a long period of time is still in play here. So uh, I, I like the idea still of chemotherapy in the frontline setting for these patients because we're going to visit a BTK inhibitor in combination with rituximab probably at a relapse, which is hopefully a long way down the road. We have other agents that are emerging too, right? And I, and I, and I really uh, am excited about the idea of improving on what we've just been talking about. And hopefully the newer uh, agents or BTK inhibitors like acalabrutinib and zanubrutinib will do that in Waldenstrom's as well. Um, that's a perfect uh, time to talk about acalabrutinib in, in uh, Waldenstrom. So, you know, 
What do you think? What are the data? What's the data look like? I mean, well, there's only phase two data that that we have with the calibrutinib. It's been uh, presented. It's um, good data. It looks uh, very consistent with everything we know about a calibrutinib from a efficacy standpoint as well as a toxicity standpoint. Uh, but the but the improvement over ibrutinib in this setting isn't clear. We'll have to see again over time. But there's clearly a role of a calibrutinib in, in these patients in the future, I think, as well. Yeah. Matt, so the, the biology is a little bit different here Do you, as compared to CLL. I mean, in CLL, we, we sort of know that adding rituximab to a BTK inhibitor, uh, or at least to, to a brutinib, doesn't really add much. We don't, and like, and, um, but in, in Walden's terms, we don't have that study that shows you know, that, that, what do you, do you think you can just apply what we know in CLL to uh, Waldenstrom? No, I mean, I, I think the biology of the disease is different. And so, you know, I think that from the Innovate study, we certainly see nice data from the abrutinib rituximab combination. Of course, it would have been nice to have an abrutinib only arm there. Yeah. Just to see that difference, we don't, we don't have that data. Um, but, you know, certainly I don't think we can extrapolate from CLL. It'd be very helpful to study that here. Um, until we have those data, I think, you know, it's, it's a discussion. And, and I think using the combination, particularly because rituximab tends to be more eff efficacious in Waldenstrom at least as a single agent compared to in CLL, where we don't tend to see much activity of rituximab as a single agent. So I think here, using the combination makes sense until we have more definitive data. Are there, um, are there any um, other new agents that we should talk about in this disease? I mean, we haven't, Zanubrutinib, again, you know, it's, it's, it's another BTK inhibitor, um, has broad activity in all the different uh, malignancies. Any reason to believe it's going to be better or worse in, um, in uh, Waldenstrom than it is in the other diseases? Not sure. Uh, my, my understanding is Xanabrutinib may get its first um, FDA indication in Waldenstrom's. The, that trial that they're performing is the most mature. Um, so again, it'll be a nice option to have in Waldenstrom's, whether it offers advantages over Ibrutinib or acalabrutinib remains to be seen. There are some theoretical reasons why xanabrutinib might have some advantages in getting into nodal compartments, um, although that's, again, I think theoretical and is yet, yet to be proven definitively. Um, but it'll be a nice option to have. And Why would that be? Is it ha has to do with the PK or mm -hmm. is it the size of the molecule? Why would there be a difference in the compartment effect, right? Well, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> okay. And um, it, it may be a real phenomenon and it may not. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if you have any insight on that. No. Um, okay. <laughs> But yeah, there has been, you know, there's the data, well, yeah. So yeah. I think that with Xanabrutinib, they've done lymph node biopsies and shown very nice occupancy mm -hmm. in the lymph node tissue. Uh, but unfortunately, that hasn't been done as rigorously in a comparative fashion with the other BTK inhibitors. So we just, we don't right. know. So is yeah. there a theoretical reason why it would be different? Not that I know. There's no but, no. yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, well, time will tell. <laughs>